from LPM, Louisville Public Media. Support comes from the Eye Care Institute and Butchertown Clinical Trials, where they strive for diversity, equity, and inclusion within their staff, patients, and clinical trial participants. To learn more, visit butchertown.clinic. Welcome to episode 12 of Where Y'all Really From. I'm your host, Dan Wu, and y'all, this is the season finale. It's incredible. We just finished an entire season of this podcast. Um, Yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Uh, My guests today, I'm very excited to welcome uh, two Lexingtonians, um, two med students, two Asian Americans, and also two of the world's best in fencing. Uh, welcome, Garrick Meinhardt. Thank you. Great to be here. And Lee Kiefer. Thanks for having us. Uh, absolutely. Um, so not only do we have like one fencing champion in Lexington, Kentucky, we have two, and you all are married to each other. What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> That's not standard. <laughs> uh, no, uh, yeah, it is, it's not very standard at all. Uh, how did you all meet? You can take this. Yeah, sure. So we were friends for a long time. The fencing world is pretty small. We were on a lot of world championship teams together growing up. And then I guess the romance started like at our, right before our first Olympic Games together in 2012. And then right after that, Lee came to Notre Dame, which is where I was already at. So we got to spend college together. And um, I mean, fast forward a little bit. Lee grew up in Lexington, had grown up in Lexington and came to medical school here. And that's how I got brought here to to be with her. So I forced him to join me in Kentucky. (laughs) Right. The the best place in the world. Exactly. He's very Um, lucky. Yeah. So, Garrick, you grew up in uh, San Francisco. I got to spend a little bit of time there uh, in my 20s. And I have to imagine for you growing up in a place that's just very casually diverse, like mm-hmm. just all the time, and especially for Asian Americans, and then moving to a place like Lexington, Kentucky. What was your transition and sort of how did you adapt? What, what things immediately struck you? Obviously, just the, the people that you're around, the lack of diversity is is very shocking in a way. At the same time, I think Lee and I both, well, Lee growing up here is a little different, but for me, I guess, I was prepared for it by the fact that I went to Notre Dame for college, and so there, Asians and, in general, um, minorities are not a huge percentage of the student population. So I think that was probably the biggest change for me when I was 18 and I went to Notre Dame, but um, so moving here to Lexington was was not too big of a change for me. Yeah. And Lee, for you, you were born and raised here, right? Right. I was born in Cleveland, but I've lived here essentially my whole life. Um, Going back to Garrick's upbringing, this is kind of a funny fact. So we have a lot of national tournaments. And ever since I was like 10 years old, the San Francisco club he goes to M team and the Bluegrass Fencers Club, all of our fencers have been friends. There's something about like the casual San Francisco energy and maybe like the friendly southern mm-hmm. hospitality mm-hmm. of Kentucky <laughs> that somehow works very well together. That um, is funny. <laughs> that is funny. Um, you all both started fencing at a young age, right? Did you, uh, I know one of you comes from a fencing family. Do both of you? So my dad was a fencer in college. Um, so he's from Kentucky and fencing was not big in Kentucky at all. I'm pretty sure he had never heard of this sport before going to college. Mm. But his freshman year, he must have seen a sign and just walked on to the fencing team, became a captain. And then, like most people, you have to get a real job and you Mm -hmm. quit your sport. Um, But he went to medical school. He started a family. And when I was seven years old and my older sister was nine, he threw us into the sport, later my brother. And like you said, it's been a family affair ever since. Is there a baby-sized foil that they start you off with or what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is. It's shorter, lighter. Um, uh, yeah, I, we started I need there. to, at some point, get a picture of you as a seven-year-old <laughs> in the get-up with a little baby foil. That was that, very cute. That sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, Garrick, you started off pretty young too, right? Yeah, so I was nine and a half, and it's actually a pretty good story how I got into the sport. My mom grew up in Taiwan, and she was in a musical boarding school over there. Uh, and one of her classmates also moved to the Bay Area when she was young, like my mom did. And they kept in touch, and eventually my mom's classmate married an Olympic fencer 
who was looking to start up a fencing club in the Bay Area. I was already taking piano lessons from my mom's classmate, so it seemed pretty natural for me to also take fencing lessons from her husband. And there was a period of overlap where I would get dropped off at their house for my piano lesson, and then I would ride with my coach to the fencing practice. And we're really close family friends. He's still my coach. Um, We just saw the the wife, my old piano teacher, last weekend. So it's it's like a family family thing for us in, in a way, even though my parents didn't fence. Yeah, that's it, it's it's funny to me thinking about stuff like piano lessons and you know sports and stuff like Asian Americans like very stereotypically um, are always like pushed into piano and violin particularly, but like <laughs> classical kind of instrument stuff. Uh, you're pushed to excel academically, but sports wise, like for the most part, it seems like Asian parents don't push their kids into like like team sports like football and basketball and stuff, but. You have tennis stars, you have, you know, uh, Olympic sports Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's always kind of, I don't know, it's it's funny to sometimes look at how we fit into stereotypes and then also like not fit into stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did you all, um, when you were growing up, how much of, because, you know, to get to uh, any sport at the level that you play, it's a ton of discipline, right? I think we love to talk about talent, but you all know how much absolute just grueling hard work it is. Um, for you as a kid, especially at any point, did you were you like screw this? I don't <laughs> want to do this, or this is too hard, or I want to go play something else. <laughs> Definitely for me, um, I fought my parents and my coach. You know, for the first five years, it was like pulling teeth constantly. Um, Sports are hard. When you start and you're not good at something, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. there's no reward there. And you're young. You could be hanging out with your friends. There were, you know, other shiny things I I were interested in. But I give my parents full credit, not myself, for helping me, you know, learn how to work hard, put your head down, even when it's not glamorous or fun. And as I grew up, I mean, this is just like a few years into it. Like I started making friends through the fencing community. I started seeing benefits of the time I put into the sport. Um, So it provided a lot of growth. But I have to give my parents credit for that initial push, which Mm. I think is a very stereotypical Asian Uh (laughs) mentality. (laughs) Yeah. And for me, my mom was... Um, pretty much a stereotypical tiger mom. And so my (laughs) older sister, she's six years older than me. Um, We both played piano growing up. And while I got lessons from my mom's friend, my mom would be there during our our lessons at home uh, and during our practice at home. And we would definitely butt heads. And it was, Mm. there were definitely tears at times. Uh, And once I started fencing, after a couple of years of doing both at the same time, my fencing coach convinced his wife that, you know, I had a lot of potential in fencing and it was time for me to really focus on that (laughs) instead of piano. (laughs) So I switched over to that and, you know, my mom would be there at practice making sure my knees are bent, that I had good technique. And at the time, you know, sometimes I didn't appreciate it, but now looking back on it, uh, of course, like that's why I am the fencer that I am. And like, I'm known for my technique and my fundamentals and all of that starts when you're little and the discipline that you have then. Um, and it's funny you mention Asian Americans in individual and Olympic sports. Fencing is definitely well represented, by, or Asians are well represented in fencing. Mm. So that goes along with what you said. Uh, my older sister did play basketball, and my dad was the one that was very involved with that because he was a <laughs> basketball player. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I feel like my mom was a tiger mom that pushed me a lot in fencing, but I, I learned just as much. Uh, from my dad and being there rebounding the ball as he drilled my sister mm. um, and, and prepared her for college basketball. You all have both been to multiple Olympics at this point. Um, what was it like the first time you like qualified for the Olympics? Did it feel like a shock and like a huge step up? Or did it feel like this is just the culmination of just like what I've been working towards? So Garrick is four years older than me, and he was actually in the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Um, that was his first games, and my first game was London. But we, I think in a way we had similar experiences. We were 
both babies. So at our first games, we were 18 years old. Um, the U.S. was not necessarily the strongest in the specific uh, discipline of fencing we're in. And a combination of luck and peaking at the right time, you know, support from our parents and coach, like we kind of rose into success mm. very fast. Not to take away from our hard work, but, you know, sometimes being young makes things easier. And I think we were just kind of excited <laughs> to be participating at that point in our careers. Yeah. When but, you when you arrived in your at your first Olympics, when when the plane landed, did it feel like surreal? Did you have to like pinch yourself a little bit? Definitely. I, you're going in there and you're seeing like NBA players that you've seen on TV and athletes from bigger sports and being an 18 year old there. Like for me, honestly, looking back on it, it was 13 years ago now. It's kind of a blur. It was just overwhelming. Kind of, it went by pretty fast because Lee was similar four years later, but we left as soon as our events were over to go to our freshman years of college. And so uh, it's definitely changed as far as our expectations going into that first one and it, more of it being like an incredible experience. And the fact that you qualified was the accomplishment versus now, obviously, we, we're going into we, the past couple of games. We've gone into it with the dream of winning gold. And Lee was thankfully able to accomplish that. Yes, she was. <laughs> um, do you all ever get competitive with each other just in terms of like, you know, winning or coming in second or who's got a championship and who's got a this and that? Um, results wise, we're not competitive being like, oh, you did this. I'm going to do this. No, no, no. We, sh we share every single success. It's mm -hmm. just like it's. It's additive for us. Um, but if you see us at practice, that is a different <laughs> story. Uh -huh. When we're at a normal weekly practice, um, even fencing five touches, 15 touches, just bouting for time or fun, I start to get fiery because I, I don't. I don't like to lose. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know Garrick's not very good. He's like number two in the world. Yeah. So I shouldn't be hard on myself. <laughs> um, but that's part of the reason we're such good training partners is because we can play, be creative, but we also have a little bit of angst and a little bit of fight in us. <laughs> when you all train, um, is it co-ed training? Do you only train women against women, men against men? I've spent my whole life doing co-ed. Some other clubs around the country, they like to separate the genders more. Um, Do you feel like, because uh, this is a conversation that, that happens in sports a lot about whether or not men and women can compete on the same level in different kinds of sports. Do you feel like something like fencing, um, that men and women could compete in the same category? And if not, why not? So I think it's tricky because Garrick is a lot more muscular, which gives him a lot more strength than speed. And he also has height over me. Um, but that being said, like, I'm able to, like, compensate with, like, my quickness, like, being hard to hit. But I, it's that's hard for me to answer. We definitely train well together, but I don't know on a competition or Olympic level if it's practical at this point to mix the genders. I also think that it would take a while to get to the, that point uh, just because like you had kind of alluded to earlier, like a lot of clubs do have the gender separate when they train together and the games are very different between the men and the women just stylistically. Hmm. So I think that um, the the women would maybe are, would be at a disadvantage just because the guys fence may be like more um, physically and just in different ways that I, I do think that they they are like a lot of the women like are faster and have different um, skills and strengths that they would be over able to overcome that once, once they got adjusted to the game. So I, yeah. th I think that's and maybe the, the focus too on how like being strong and like fast like how that's how sports are interesting like my coach Bucky Leach he always said like he enjoyed coaching and watching the women's game more just the strategy mm. is very different and I think at baseline fencing is hard for outsiders to understand but mm. I think once you get into it like you can appreciate those strategy differences too well I will say um I was watching some clips of fencing leading up to this and I was just like what happened right there <laughs> exactly. like the two people kind of <laughs> lunging at each other and then suddenly like one of them won and I was like wait what 
and uh, so I feel like I need <laughs> one of you all to like sit down and watch it with me to be like, oh, okay, here you touched the thing and this happened. Um, yeah, it, it is kind of a, a harder mm-hmm. sport to, to, to get, right? Yeah, I think if you have time, you should come to the club. I mm. think that's the best way to understand is holding the weapon mm-hmm. in your hand, getting a sense of the purpose behind the movements. Yeah. Uh, another cool, interesting thing I saw recently uh, as Mark Zuckerberg was uh, rebranding and launching Facebook into Meta, I saw on your Instagram there was a video of Mark Zuckerberg uh, fencing with a hologram uh, and then uh, realized it was Lee Kiefer. Uh, <laughs> what was that filming experience like? What was Mark Zuckerberg like? Yeah, so it's really surprising for us that that clip even existed in the first place because a few weeks after Olympics, I got a, a DM from Mark on my Instagram. It was like... <laughs> no big deal, just yeah, a DM from and, Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Sure. He had like posted how his daughters were excited seeing... Did you think it was f- fake when you first got it? Like, no, if it I got said a... Zuck with a check mark. I was like... Oh. Okay, I was going to say, if I got a message from Mark Zuckerberg, I'd be like, meh. <laughs> There are a lot of fake accounts out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, but essentially, he invited us to teach his daughter and his daughter's friend fencing because they were so excited after watching the Olympics. So I think they honestly, they wanted us because we're fencers, but also because his daughters are half Asian too. And just inviting people who are at the top mm. of their game, some people who you know, have interests in professional careers too. They wanted to introduce their daughters to people who look like them Mm -hmm. and who have done cool things. Mm -hmm. And that just happened to coincide with the shooting of his keynote speech. Um, But his daughters are so cute and the family is incredible. They are so kind and down to earth. Yeah, we had no idea what to expect, obviously, of one of the most successful um, people in the world. And we were a bit apprehensive going there, but they just like welcomed us in as we were as if we were friends. We spent the weekend with them, got to play with the the kids, fen- teaching them some fencing, also just messing around and having fun. And it was really cool to see the daughters um, just enjoy fencing and like the idea of sword fighting because we were there at one point when we were their ages mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you talk about representation. That's something that comes up over and over again in the show, and something that just we think about a lot. When you were when you all were growing up and getting into fencing and not just fencing specifically, but just thinking about like Asian American athletes, right? Uh, you know, for the longest time before, say Yao Ming or Justin Lin or Jeremy Lin came in to the scene, um, all we had as Asian Americans in terms of athletes for the most part was Olympians, right? Um, going back to Chrissy Yamaguchi and mm-hmm. and before that, did you all have us? folks that you particularly looked up to in sort of the sports realm and and did that ever was that ever a thing for you you know I, I we talk about the term like it's hard to be it when you can't see it did you all have ever have that sense or not honestly for me it sounds corny but my older sister was my role model mm. like I said she went on to play d1 basketball but I was there for like hours just rebounding the ball for her chasing after her and my dad as they practiced and listening to her on the radio even when she was at college and like keeping my own stats even though like right after the game they would have the box score released and so for me to see the hard work that she put in but also like her all the awards she won um at, ac- academically while in high school um was inspiring to me and and someone that I looked up to more so than the professional level and the generation of so we fence foil specific type of fencing and the generation of women's foils above me there were multiple half asian hmm. females represented and i always took that for granted like i i never questioned that i could or couldn't be an olympian i was like yeah like that's me i just have to rave it a little bit put in the work um so i think that makes fencing unique and rare, but I would love to ask them what it was like for them to grow up and probably not have anyone before them. Mm, yeah, for sure. The, we, we always stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Where Y'all Really From. We'll be right back.
Hey, this is Dan Wu. And if you like Where Y'all Really From, then you should check out another show that we love called Self Evident. The show tells true stories about everyday life in Asian America, and it gets the tough questions about who we are, where we stand, and where we're going. They just launched a new season, starting with a two-part story about Asian and Black women trying to remove a white nationalist from their local farmer's market in Bloomington, Indiana. So check it out wherever you get podcasts. Just search for Self Evident Asian America's Stories. Support for the Louisville Public Media Podcast Incubator comes from the Community Foundation of Louisville, helping donors in our community establish charitable funds to meet philanthropic goals, creating opportunities to give more through scholarship, charitable checking, and donor-advised funds, and helping donors create a charitable legacy through their estate plan. More at cflouisville.org. Where better to tell your company's story than with the most trusted storyteller? Louisville Public Media is our community's largest and most influential local voice, reaching more than 300,000 people every week. Learn more about the benefits of business sponsorship at 814-6521. Thanks. You're listening to Where Y'all Really From. I'm your host, Dan Wu. We're in the finale episode, episode 12 of our first season, and my guests today are uh, Garrick Meinhardt and Lee Kiefer, uh, Olympic fencing. I'm just going to call you all champions. Y- you all have multiple championships mm-hmm. under your belt. I have this whole list of like all your achievements and stuff, and I just can't even look at it. It's too, <laughs> it's too many things. But at some point, you all have won. You all have been number one in the sport in different divisions, different areas. Um, you all just came back from uh, Tokyo this year, this year being, I would imagine, different than previous Olympic years because of COVID. Um, the sports and the competition aside, what was the general atmosphere like? What was the vibe like? Like, where did you all stay? Did you have roommates? Like, what's the life of an Olympian at the Olympics? Um, okay, so pandemic time the biggest difference was that our family and friends could not be there with us in person Mm. and obviously that was incredibly sad because for us that's probably 90 percent of the reason you know we grind these Mm. four years but once we got over that um the olympics went on beautifully japan did an amazing job of making sure we had an incredible athlete village the dining hall which you've probably heard of it was beautifully done um so many different food choices Mm. we had too much ramen before and after the competition breakfast lunch (laughs) dinner yes ramen why is this booth open for all Mm. meals Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, everyone was wearing masks. We had COVID tests every day, but honestly, it didn't take away from the spirit in that environment, which was a fear for a lot of people, especially people who were at their first games. Mm -hmm. Um, do you all get to hang out with other athletes from other countries or other athletes from the U S? Um, what's the, what's the after hours like? I would say there is less intermingling of the sports at this games, just naturally since Mm -hmm. um, because of all the protocols. But uh, typically there are big parties that all the athletes go to when their events are over. It isn't as wild as as people expect, like in the village, because you have to be conscientious of other athletes who may not be done with their events yet and Mm -hmm. like making too much noise in Mm -hmm. the in the the apartments. But for, uh, for Lee and me, a highlight of past games has been actually not necessarily the partying, but like as soon as our events are over, signing up for as many tickets as we can get to watch other sports oh, and yeah. sports that we haven't seen before. Yeah. So we went to like bad, we went, I don't know how many, like over 10 different events in like Rio, for different instance. Events. Wow. Yeah, right. like watched all sorts of sports. And it was so fun just to see and kind of relate, I guess, in a way with all these athletes that are like their dream has been to be in that moment and mm-hmm. to, to compete for, for a medal or whatever their situation is. So that, that's definitely one of the most exciting things for us. I can imagine, too, like after having done your own competitions, just to be able to sit back and like watch somebody else sweat it out uh, <laughs> must be 
like interesting do you also find yourself even though like all the sports are very different like if you're watching like archery or badminton or swimming or something do you find yourself i don't know getting in back into that like athlete's mindset of like either critiquing or like thinking like oh i wonder how they feel about that or what's going on with this i I definitely like to think about like where they are in their careers, you know, if they're younger, you know, they've been through college, like they're married, like you go through a lot of life mm. over a short span of like five to 10 years, yeah. the duration of a athlete's career. But essentially, I, I just want everyone to do well. I just feel so bad whenever someone loses because you just, mm. you know, and you feel the heartbreak that comes mm. Like, I was thinking about it in the car, and I'm like, the Olympics are kind of like Christmas. Like, you spend so long, like, thinking about it. It's uh-huh. going to be, like, the best day of your whole life. <laughs> and then you're there, and sometimes it is, but, like, it's over so fast. Uh-huh. And then afterwards, you're like, wow, <laughs> like, yeah. what's what's next? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, for you all, I mean, is there such thing as a break, or are you all just right back into sort of practice? What's the... Because, you know, it's it's a it's a four years in between, right? So, and you all have your own regular lives and you're all in med school, which obviously keeps you busy. Um, what's the cycle like in terms of like your training schedule? Like, does it amp up the last year? How does that work? Pretty much every season is the same for us as far as the schedule of the World Cups that we have mm-hmm. that start typically in November and go until May. And then we will have our zonal championships in June, followed by world championships or the Olympics every four years in at the end of July. So we get a little bit of a break. Sometimes you take like longer of a break than maybe you should, I mean, because you need it. Um, and then you go into the first tournament not completely tuned up, but it's mm. okay. You needed that like mental and physical break after a big event like the Olympics. Mm. This year is a little weird. We're still having some tournaments postponed and canceled with, with the pandemic. Uh, and international travel. So I've gotten, I'd say, a little bit more of a break than after past big events, which has been really nice and and really needed. Yeah, breaks are important Mm. because, I mean, we do go, go very hard, like in terms of school and sports. But I've also noticed, like through social media, people, social media people are like oh my god they're so perfect they're doing everything like no we get exhausted Uh and like uh we don't do everything perfectly and i just i want to make sure people know like it's okay to like work hard but also don't be too hard on yourselves unnecessarily Mm -hmm. and just like learn your limits yeah i mean we've seen you know i think in recent years too i i feel like the the zeitgeist and the conversation with professional sports has kind of shifted too uh in particular like naomi um osaka is a great example of that somebody who's basically bowing out of major events uh, mm-hmm. at the height of her career because she wants to take time for herself she was just done with all those pressers and stuff like that um and it's, I think it's great that we're finally talking about mental health when it comes to sort of elite athletes because we, we take it for granted. Oh, these people are just the best and they train all day long and, and everything is fine. But mm-hmm. for you all, like, mentally, what's the pressure of winning or not winning, especially when you're at this level of the game, like when you go into, you know, a tournament or an event? I this is kind of a weird answer, but a lot of Americans, their students and their athletes, and so they kind of go most of their careers trying to do both. And for most of my life, I kind of like justified in my head like not doing well, being like I'm just I have so much on mm-hmm. my plate, like I'm doing my best, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um but like I myself am probably like the biggest person who puts pressure Mm. on myself, but I'm entering this weird stage of my life. So I'm taking a little time off of med school in order to pursue Paris. So I'm like officially a professional athlete, which is Mm. so weird to say for a few years. Uh uh Um, But yes, I need to re-navigate like what this pressure is going to do. Like what do these results mean? Like how am I going to handle myself and recover? I think that at the end of the day, like, we really love fencing. We love the opportunity to like inspire and meet and um, maybe teach and provide 
um, be provide a role model to younger fencers. So obviously we want to win. We want to win gold. We want to be successful, but at the same time we want to to set a good example and just loving the sport is enough at times. And I think that with our platform, we're trying to show people that we aren't perfect, like Lee said, and that we go through struggles and that we don't win every tournament that we go to. And it's funny because we'll like put out a message and a, and a caption about how we aren't perfect. And people will be like, yeah, you are. And it's like, <laughs> it's, but I mean, it's, it's social media, right? Everybody yeah. you follow looks perfect on yes. social media. Uh, I enjoyed the, um, just random behind the scenes kind of stuff that you all post on social media. I think Lee, you posted something about the amount of sweat <laughs> that came off of your body during a, uh, a training or a practice, and like you actually weighed it. Uh, what was it? It was like three or four pounds of sweat. Uh, it was something ridiculous. Yeah, I think it was three pounds. I was pretty disappointed because you know the temperature has gotten colder. It wasn't as humid, but I think mm-hmm. I can get to eight pounds on like a really. Wait, Wild so so day. sweating a lot is one of your goals? Like no, you're, you're, it just okay. happens and it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's such a weird thing. It's like I've never thought of the, the idea to like weigh sweat. Um, <laughs> but but there you go. That's uh, super random. That's her like. brain. That's I like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. What is something that you all do that, I don't know, you wouldn't want your coach to know about? in terms of just like a bad habit or junk food you eat or some kind of just, you know, guilty pleasure thing that you do? Definitely there's the junk food and um, occasional drinks after we have a tournament. We have a little break for a while. My coach knows about that. (laughs) He's fine with it. Uh Uh, But growing up when I was younger, we had a two-floor fencing club, and he would give lessons on the bottom floor while we did our free fencing and our bouting upstairs. And I would just go crazy, just like not having good form, just having fun and doing all these wild things. And he definitely would not have liked me doing that if he'd come upstairs. In fact, like he would come upstairs and we'd see him and we'd all like, oh, like, oh, we're being disciplined. (laughs) But I think that that creativity and the fun that I had with it carried over into like the fencer that I am now and and that I'm able to do all sorts of different actions. (laughs) So he'd be happy now having looked back on it. (laughs) I'm sure there's plenty of things I do that would annoy my coach. But like Eric said, we are from Kentucky. And sometimes to relax afterwards, we will have a glass of bourbon. Um, So, yeah, that's part of us. Yeah. I was was wondering, too, like you all were talking about like the parties and stuff, uh, you know, in the Olympic Village. Like, you know, for any other group of people, you could probably just like go hog wild and, and do whatever. And I'm trying to imagine as athletes, I guess there's a difference between like if you've done all your events and mm-hmm. you're done, done, I can see like kicking back. But did it ever get like super, super wild? <laughs> one of from Rio, one of my teammates, I think he went out two weeks in a row and he was on some schedule where he'd go to bed at like seven in the morning and wake up at noon. And he -hmm. just looked so terrible (laughs) afterwards. I think he had given up drinking like the whole year before. Mm. And then his, he was really abusing his body after he competed. A couple weeks later, we talked about like the end of the games and we barely saw him because we were on different sleep schedules. Lee and I were going to like every possible sporting event that we could, as I Mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. And he's like, what? You got to see that game? What? You went to that? Like, yeah, because you were sleeping. You were like out partying, which is great. We did it a few times and we, but I mean, we can also do that at home. What was your favorite uh, sport to watch like in person at the Olympics? Mm. I really liked rhythmic gymnastics Mm. i think it's so beautiful Mm -hmm. and it's so different from what we do like i can't keep a beat if i tried i'm not coordinated in that way like with my toes and Mm -hmm. (laughs) hands um yeah i just find so much beauty and art in all the different sports um and just like appreciation you know for the differences in training and mental or physical discipline like every sport's different and just learning like no one's better than the next sport or next person it's just different and that's why it's cool that it makes it so inclusive to like different body types and personalities Mm -hmm. 
And for me, I'm a huge NBA fan. We were able to go see like the championship game mm. in Rio, and that was really cool. But at the same time, like I also like just watching on TV, so you can really see <laughs> everything up close. Yeah, that's true. Like yeah. live, you don't you don't get the slow mo. Yeah, you don't get the commentary. The great commentary. You're just like, wait, what happened? Exactly. I can imagine for like if I were watching your matches live, mm-hmm. I'd be like. What happened? Did she win? Yeah. Who, somebody, somebody, tell me something. Um, whereas, at least with you know basketball, even if you're courtside, you can you understand the game. You mm-hmm. can kind of see most of uh, what's happening with it. Yeah, but I'd say that badminton was my favorite to watch live. Huh. It was just it's so fast, and they're just like yeah moving all over the place. I like played a little in like PE in high school, so I, at least yeah. I know the basic rules. So yes. it, was, it was just really exciting. And well, and when you watch really it at that level. The difference between backyard badminton and like <laughs> Olympic badminton, I have to imagine, is like you know riding a, a kid's tricycle and a, and a Harley, probably. Yeah. Um, really cool. I've always had this idea um, that we should do a competition where a, like Olympic top level athletes have to draw a sport out of a hat to compete in. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just like, and, and your sport will not be in that hat. Mm-hmm. So it's just like drawing random things. Um, if you could, just for complete fun, what what Olympic sport would you try out? I can go first. So not only are we big Olympic fans, we're also big Paralympic fans. Mm. When we were training this past year, we spent a lot of time in Colorado Springs, and we met a friend on the ba- wheelchair basketball team who was so cool. Um, he basically showed us a few moves on the court and destroyed us, and it was awesome. <laughs> um, but like, this is the first time I've had a chance to like watch more of the Paralympics. Mm-hmm. And there's a crazy sport called goalball where there's athletes on each team like blindfolded because they have different levels of visual impairment, mm-hmm. and the ball has like a bell in it, and they have to like defend and shoot like completely wow. without That's their awesome. vision. Yeah. It's really cool. And I would love to try that. Wow, that is that is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'd be terrible at all those sports, <laughs> especially at the Olympic level. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say my only hope maybe I would score. I would want to play basketball, even uh-huh. though, of course, if anyone defended me, I would never score. I'd probably not barely be able to dribble. But maybe, <laughs> just maybe, they'll be like double teaming Steph Curry, and I'll be open in the yeah. corner, and I can make one shot. That'd yeah. be my. That'd be the dream. <laughs> yeah, as Eminem said, one shot, one <laughs> opportunity. That's all I need. <laughs> all right, I know you all are fast on the. What do you call it? It's not the court. It's a the strip. W- the strip. Yeah. Okay, because it's like a thin. Like, how wide is that strip that you're competing on? It's uh, maybe f- four feet wide, okay, approximately, and it's it was supposed to like I think the idea behind it was like dueling in the alley uh, back uh, in the old uh, days. Uh, we should do this like Indiana Jones style where you're on like a rope bridge. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean, yes. like That'd classic stuff. Um, do you all ever see like um, fencing or like sword fighting in movies? And you're like, no, that's not their form is all bad. And oh yeah, it's completely different. That's all. For drama, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I saw The Princess Bride recently. And oh, I that love famous, that movie. Uh, what did you all think of that fencing scene at the top um, of the mountain? Excellent. Yeah. It had the perfect amount of drama for me. I don't know if I you noticed, but Lee switched hands <laughs> during her Olympic gold medal <laughs> oh, bout. Nice. <laughs> nice. It's just like, yeah, there's something you should know about me. Yes, exactly. I'm also not left-handed. <laughs> yes. That's great. That's great. Um, okay, so I know you all are fast on the strip, but. We'll see how fast you are with our lightning round questions. Here we go. Uh, we'll start with you, Garrick. Uh, what is your superpower? So my superpower for Lee's family, at least, specifically her grandparents, is being the the geek patrol and being able to fix their technology. Nice. The IT guy. The IT guy. Nice. It's usually pretty simple stuff, but hey. in, their, yeah. in their minds. It's like, Grandma, have you tried superpower. unplugging it and plugging yes. it back in? <laughs> but I love it. I love to be useful, so yeah. it's great. What about you, Lee? Napping. I can sleep at any time, probably for any duration. Wow. That is, that's, that's a skill that I'm actually jealous of because I'm a terrible napper. <laughs> I fall asleep when I don't want to. I can't fall asleep when I do want to. Oh, I wake no. up cranky like a toddler. It's bad. It's not great. Uh, what song do you jam out to? Lee and I actually love musicals. So like Hamilton, Greatest Showman, like the This Is Me song. We're like, oh yeah, that pumps us up every time. Okay. Do you have a, a, a is there a particular like hype song as you're like entering the arena, that, anything like that? 
I'm more of a scary silence type of person. Mm. Um, I, I live a lot of my life on the edge of agitation and intensity. <laughs> it's just my personality. Uh-huh. I like uh-huh. to say it's genetic for my dad. Uh-huh. But yes, I'm a silence person. <laughs> uh, well, what song do you jam out to then? Um, let's see. I like Julia Michaels these days. She has some powerful woman energy that I resonate with. Nice. Uh, what's your favorite comfort food? Hawaiian barbecue for me. So mm. like the grilled barbecue mix plate or chicken curry katsu with two scoops of rice and yeah. some macaroni salad. Like every time mm. I go to San Francisco, as soon as I land in SFO, uh-huh. you got to be driven there. Yeah. Take a stop, get some Hawaiian barbecue eat it at home. And you know we have a place in Lexington now, right? Yeah, we haven't made it over there yet, but we're really excited. Yeah, yeah, the big kahuna. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Lee? Cookies. I'm a big cookie monster. (laughs) Uh, Favorite cookie? Oh, maybe chocolate chip, but Garrick really got me into toffee, so put Mm. a little toffee with that chocolate. Mm, Chef's kiss. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Is there a cookie that you won't eat? Ooh... Mm, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the most Kentucky thing that you do? Definitely bourbon. We really got into bourbon once we moved here. It's like what we use to entice our friends to come visit mm-hmm. that will go along the bourbon trail. We were into the hunting with her her dad and my family has even gotten into it in the Bay Area and so do you have a do you have a favorite? Um, I feel like we really like going to Buffalo Trace. Just the tour is, mm-hmm. I mean, as long nowadays it's kind of hard to, to get a reservation, but it's their canvas is beautiful, and um, I, I'd say that's one of my favorite. Mm-hmm. I really like Rise. So in college, I was a weenie, and I could only drink Moscato and the really sweet things. Uh-huh. And then I practiced my bourbon and now I'm so advanced. I love rye. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that, that you just said practiced bourbon. Yeah, I did. Because <laughs> that's what you all do. You practice makes perfect. You all yeah, practice. Uh, do you all get the Asian flush? Not usually, actually. I don't. Lee occasionally yeah. does. Just I like think it's some maybe other one out reaction. of every twenty times. The other it's weekend I did, strange. and people were thought I need to go to the hospital. But I was like, I've had one drink. I don't know what happened. But a lot of our friends did growing up. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I guess you can you can thank your dads for the uh, yeah. the enzyme. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Lee and Garrick, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been such fun chatting with y'all. Thanks yeah, for thanks having for having us. us. It's been awesome. great. You've been listening to Where Y'all Really From. See you next season. Where Y'all Really From is created by Dan Wu, Charlene Buckles, Nima Kalkarni, and Mae Cermak, and hosted by Dan and Charlene. Our show is edited by Alex Cooper, and our music is by Kojin Tashiro. Graphic design by Leanne Gann. Where Y'all Really From is part of the Louisville Public Media Podcast Incubator, with support from the Community Foundation of Louisville, Podchaser, Rankings.io, and the Eye Care Institute's Butchertown Clinical Trials. Our executive producer is Laura Ellis. For more information and to keep in touch, visit whereyallreallyfrom.org. Support comes from the Eye Care Institute and Butchertown Clinical Trials, where they strive for diversity, equity, and inclusion within their staff, patients, and clinical trial participants. To learn more, visit butchertown.clinic. The news never stops, but sometimes you need to. Follow the WFPL Daily News Briefing Podcast, and we'll get you back up to speed every morning. Follow us here in your podcast app or see more at wfpl.org slash daily news.